Uh, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, open them up to the book of Matthew. I eat way too much turkey over the last few days. There's two Matthews. We can use your Matthew if you want to, so. Nah. Alright. We're going to look at something that's uh, actually pretty, uh, very, very familiar. Um, we're going to look at a, just, the, the, there's a lot of different aspects in it that we could preach in s several uh, uh, different ways, but I, I believe the direction that we're going to go this morning is uh, slightly interesting, to say the least. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, just uh, uh, out of this very familiar uh, passage here, there's just a, a couple of things that I, that I really want to bring out. Um, uh, the good news is I'm not going to be near as hard on you this week as I was last week. Um, that, would, I guess, would be your, your, your shining light, if you will. Um, but it goes hand in hand. It goes right along with it. So uh, uh, God's still, God still sending the same messages. He's just going to give you a break this week. But in the book of Matthew and in chapter 14, uh, beginning in verse 13, now as we all know, uh, or maybe some of us know, and some of you will find out whenever you get turned over there, we know that this is where Jesus fed the 5,000. And we know that this was... Uh, uh, one of the only miracles that is recorded in all four Gospels. We know that their accounts in all four are more similar to this account than there are any other account than what Jesus done. Uh, but there is uh, just a, a couple things in here that I really want us to look at. Um, and we're going to look at, if you, wanna, if you know where it's at in Mark, uh, you can go ahead and, and, and flip that way and you can kind of hold your finger there because we're going to look at this same passage in Mark. And I think we're going to look at it as well in Luke, just a, just a couple of the, the, the different phrases, different verbiage, if you will. Uh, but again, there's just a couple things that I really want to bring out here that, that I, I really hope will uh, be a blessing to you today. But beginning in the 14th chapter of the book of Matthew, and in verse 13, it says this. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. Underline a part, if you will, if you have something to mark that with, underline that. That's going to be important, and we're going to come back to it. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place. And the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves uh, food. But when Jesus said unto them, They need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men beside women and children. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you again here today, again, Father, we just come before you with thankful hearts, Lord, just thankful for the opportunity to be back in your house, Father, to just to be gathered together with one another, Father, and just uh, the, with, the, with the common ground here of, of truly desiring to worship you today. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you could just speak to us through your word. Father, I ask you, Lord, that you could just grant me the, the, the courage, the boldness, the, the wisdom, and the knowledge, Father, that I, I need to, to 
to preach your word in the exact manner, Father, that you'd have it preached. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you just help to keep me out of the way here today, Father, and just have your way in our service. Father, we just ask you, Lord, that you could bind the powers of Satan here today, Father, that he would have no part of this service. Father, we just pray that everything here would be focused solely upon you, Father, with our minds and our hearts, Father, and through your word, Father, we just ask you, Lord, that you would speak to us. Father, we ask all these things in your Son, Christ Jesus' name, and amen. I told you, oh, there's a couple things here we want to look at. And we ain't going to waste no time getting into it. It says, when Jesus heard of it, and what were they talking about? It's just so you know what's going on. And this was the uh, the death of John the Baptist. Uh, uh, after he heard of these things, he departed out by ship. I need you to know that he left by ship. That is important to what we're going to look at. I need you to know that he left by ship into a desert place apart. I want you to know that he got out of the, the spot of where he was at. He left. He went uh, apart. That means he went to be by himself. He went apart from all the rest. He was alone. He went out this way. He went out by ship into a desert place. Are, are you guys get grasping that yet? He went out by himself. But I want you to catch what happened next. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him. They followed him on foot. Jesus left in a ship. Amen? That's what the Bible says. But they followed him on foot. How far of a distance do you think they traversed? How far do you think that they walked? Jesus had in his mind, he, he, had, he had his mindset, he was going out to be alone, to be apart from all the rest into a desert place. He went somewhere, you think of a desert place. You're looking somewhere where there is nothing around. But the people heard it and they followed him on foot. How hard would he have been to follow? You got to look at the multitude here. You're looking at 5,000 men. That does not count women and children. That is just 5,000 men who are attempting to follow a ship. Are you, are you getting this? Do you, or are you visually seeing what is happening here? You've got Jesus. You have Christ in a boat who took off to be by himself. And you've got a multitude, 5,000 plus people running just to be back in his presence. They heard where he was going and they followed him on foot. They dropped what they was doing. How hard would it have been to follow Jesus while he's sailing away in a ship and you're running on the shore? How hard would that have been to follow? But these multitude of people had a desire to follow Jesus. My question this morning is, do you? Do you have that kind of desire to follow Jesus? Would we drop what was going on in our lives at this very moment to chase down a boat? I want you to picture Del Hall. Everybody here has probably been to the lake at some point in time, right? You've seen the lake. And you've seen the way that shoreline is not really straight. And you've seen a boat go down the water. Now I want you to imagine that you're going to chase that boat down. How hard would that be? You would have to have full uh, 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 heart-filled desire to follow that boat. Otherwise, when it's about 200 yards out in front of you, you're going to say, yeah, I can't catch it. But they come out of their cities, they come out of their homes, they dropped what they was doing and they followed after Jesus. Do you not see, church, that this should be us? We should be that multitude that is running after him. He was in a boat. They were on foot. They had heard thereof. They followed him on foot out of the cities. We, it, you would be, it's much easier for you and I to follow Christ than it was these people who went out on foot. 
Did you know that? Did you know that it is ten times easier for you and I to follow Jesus than it is these people that were on foot? One, we have His Word. Amen? Two, we have the Holy Spirit. Amen? How much easier is it for us to follow Jesus now than it was then? But you know the one thing that they had that we didn't, that we don't? is desire. They had the desire to be in the presence of Jesus. Do you? Do we have that kind of desire that we will follow him? Now I want you to catch where it is that they went. They followed him not to some nice house. They didn't follow him to some pleasant uh, orchard or some pleasant valley. They followed him to a desert place. Would you? Would you follow Jesus to a desert place? Furthermore, would you trust him to lead you into the de to that desert place and lead you out? Now, there's some things in here that we really need to catch because the miracle here is not the feeding of the 5,000. The miracle is, it far surpasses that. I want to take your focus off the feeding of the 5,000. I want you to look at what the people did. And I want you to look at what Jesus did. They followed him on foot out of the cities, and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion. You imagine what a sight that would be. Close your eyes, visualize this with me. You've got somebody who just heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded. Now, I want you to visualize him getting in a boat and, 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 and heading out. And I want you to visualize that he steps out, you know, out of the boat where he can see and he looks around and there's tons of people flocking towards him. I can hear him, hey, there he is, he's over there. And they're running and they're moving. But what are these people doing? They're moving, number one, they're moving as one. It is a group of people moving in the same direction for the same cause. And two, they're following Christ. These people can't go wrong. But he was moved with compassion towards them. And you know, when Jesus is moved with compassion towards people, we found out in other scriptures that great things happen. Amen? But he was moved with compassion, and he healed, he healed their sick. Now let's pause. Let's look, let's reflect for just a moment. How many of you here today need a healing, whether it's a physical or a spiritual healing? How many of you here would love to have a healing, a revival of some sort inside or the, the, the physical portion of your body? Would you like the healing? Number one, are you willing to follow Jesus? If you're not willing to follow after him, I got nothing for you. Plain and simple. Number one, you got to be willing to follow after him. But furthermore, are you willing to follow him into a desert place? Or maybe it's this in your life. Maybe Christ has led you into a desert place. Maybe you're sitting in a desert place and there's nothing around that you can see. You seem to be in the middle of nowhere in your life. You seem to, that all things are going to be crashing down, if you will. But are you following Jesus? Because it don't matter where it is that he led you. Number one, he led you there. There's purpose. But maybe he led you into a desert place in your life to heal you. Now you think about the healing of the sick. How well would this work to right in the middle of a town, if you will? If he'd have been right in the middle, if he'd have been up here on Town Square and he'd have been healing the sick, how well do you think that would have worked? 
You would have had every, uh, every kind of person known to man just rolling up in there just wanting a piece of that, wouldn't he? But he led them out. He, they followed him out into that desert place so it was only his people. Those that had a desire to be in his presence, those that had a desire to see him, those that wanted, those that were sincere, the church. Do you see the comparison there? Do you see that what, what Jesus is, what, what, what this uh, scripture here in Matthew is saying is that those that really went out after Jesus, the, the true born-again believers, the Christian people, those that, that, that are, are true church members, the true body of Christ, that is who went out. That is who followed him. I want you to see and go back through different portions of the scripture, and I want you to visualize that this is exactly what it is, but he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. But not only that, but in, in, uh, um, in Mark... It says in verse 34, the sixth chapter, it says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion. Again, Jesus was compassionate upon them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd and began to teach. He began to teach them many things. So not only was they in a desert place for a healing, but they was led out into a desert place for teaching. Do you catch that as well? That just because I don't know where you're at in your life this morning, but if you seem to be in the middle of a dried up desert, that hey, that it's not the end of the world. It's either the beginning of a healing or the beginning of teaching. Do you remember just a couple of weeks ago we talked about the mountains and the valleys? Would you rather be alone on a mountaintop or in a desert place with Jesus? That's the question. And that's a given answer. Amen. Would you rather be alone on top of the mountain or would you rather be in the middle of the desert with Jesus? Preacher, it gets hot out there in the desert. I get thirsty, but Jesus is the living water, amen? Amen, there is nothing that you're going to have need of if you're in the presence of Jesus. Why can I not hear amen on that? Because there is absolutely nothing you can need as long as you're following Jesus. Amen. But they spent some time there. As you, know, well, you see in the scripture, the time began to pass. They spent a lot. I mean, you think of the 5,000 men plus women and children. I know for a fact there was 5,000 men, but I can't tell you exactly how many was there. Because if each man brought his wife, there could be 10,000. If only half the men was married, could be like 7,500. I mean, I don't know how many people was there, but I know that they had a common goal. Was to be in the presence of Jesus. But Mark says that they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And that's funny because you know what Jesus said he is? He says he is the good shepherd. Amen? Amen. This was the church that went out into the desert after him. That went uh, as far as they could go. Who There was nothing that was going to stop them from following after Jesus. Nothing. I wonder how many hills they had to cross. How many briar patches. I wonder how much if they had to swim across any really deep water. You think of all the things that could have been in their way just to follow Jesus. Now reflect. How many things have been in your way with you just trying to follow Jesus? All you had to do was just follow him. But something come up and what do we do? Well, we'll turn around. We'll quit. We'll give up. We'll think this is just too hard. I'm just going to sit here and wait. Or we'll begin to look around and we'll think, hey, you know, this just don't seem right. I know we're following after Jesus, but it looks to me like I'm being led into the desert. I see nothing around me. Hey, following Jesus is supposed to be uh, coming into blessings, amen? So if I'm following Jesus, I should be getting blessed. It shouldn't be getting looking worse. I've lived a life accordingly. i followed him. 
And all it got me was sick. All it got me was bankrupt. All it got me was alone. That's good, because you're getting out in that desert place. You're getting out there in that spot where Jesus can really begin to teach you some things, where he can really begin to work with you, amen? Is that what happened here? They was led out of the cities into a desert place. It says it twice, and just in Matthew, that it was in a desert place. But the disciples, no doubt they're probably getting tired. You imagine all these people, they're probably having to cater to them, try to keep them in straight lines, trying to maintain the order and maintain the chaos. I mean, you think about all the stuff they've been doing. It's starting to get late in the day. And they saw their opportunity. They would say, hey, hey Jesus. But it's way past supper time and we ain't got nothing for these people to eat. It's time for you to send them on home. And get them on out of here. Send them on. A lot of times that's what we as the church want to do. It begins to get a little bit late or maybe it's starting to get a little rough. And the people that are there needing help, it's just, you know, well, send them on. Get them on out of here. We ain't got time for this no more. We ain't got enough stuff to feed these people with. Get them on out of here. We ain't got time. It's late in the day. I got to get home. Sunday night football's come on tonight. Got to get home. We got to watch that. Got too much to do. Got to wash. Preacher, Jesus, we ain't got time for this. It's late and we're in the desert. Look around you, Master. We're in the desert. I've only got enough food for a small boy. And Lord knows we ain't got the money to go buy them nothing. Read your Bible. That's what they're complaining about. Read Luke. Read John. That's what they're saying. We ain't got enough money. We just got enough food for one small boy. Just a young man. That's all the food we got. Two fishes and it says five loaves. But if you really get down and study about those loaves, they're more like a roll. We ain't got nothing. But Jesus says... Hush. Quit your whining. Quit trying to get out of doing stuff and feed these people. But that's what you don't understand, Jesus. We ain't got the food. Nor do we have the faith. How many times did Jesus tell his disciples, ye of little faith? In this particular book right here, I believe you read on a little bit, and he's going to tell it to, uh, 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 well, it says in verse 31 of the same chapter of Matthew, it says, O thou of little faith. Where didst thou doubt? He says that a lot throughout his ministry. Ye have little faith. Why would you look at me? The son of the almighty. The only begotten of the father. And tell me we can't feed them. You are trying to limit the power of Jesus. That's what he's trying to get through to his disciples. They should have been saying master feed them. We know you can But instead, they said, send them away. Send them out to these villages. Send them elsewhere. Get them out of our hair. Master, we've been here all day. Jesus, we've been here all day. Trying to keep these people in line. Trying to maintain the order. Everybody just running up here, flocking up in here, trying to, just trying to take advantage of you is all they're really trying to do, Jesus. Do you not see that? They're just wanting to take advantage of you. And we're trying to keep them out here and just only really let the real sick ones come in. And I'm kind of tired of that right now. Just send them away. How many churches you know they do that? Now be honest with yourself. How many churches you know they do that? Boy, they'll start something and it'll be going real good. You know, they'll be, uh, 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 I know a church in particular, and I won't mention their name, but they started a little program, and man, it started doing real, real good. Five people got saved because of that little program. They don't want to do it no more. They ain't got time for that. That costs too much money. Ain't nobody got time to sit around and do that mess. Hey, these five souls got saved because of that. 
But we ain't got time for that. Send them on down there to them villages. Send them on down there. Let them be somebody else's problem. It ain't our job to take care of everybody. Or is it? Or is it, church? No, maybe we ain't supposed to cast our pearls out to the swine. Yeah, I know about what the Bible says about that. But I also know what the Bible says about being good stewards too, you know. But, you know, they talk about some of the, you know, the, the, the investors there that some made three times their money. And some just sat on one little penny. To just one little ounce of money and they just sat on it. But was the master happy with them too? Hey, we need to invest, church. We need to invest in these people that's in that desert place. Because something's going to happen. I want you to pay attention to what it is. Jesus says, they need not depart. They don't need to go anywhere. You are going to feed them. He says, give you them to eat. And they said unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, bring them here. Jesus said, bring them here. I want you to notice what he does. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. Now, you read in the other Gospels, and he'll say, I had them to sit down by fifties. Or by hundreds and by fifties. They sat down in the grass. But I don't need you to also see what it, what's happening here. It's people's being obedient. People are listening to the commands of Jesus. He tells them to do something, and they do it. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed, he blessed and break. He blessed it. There was a blessing of what little bit they had. Just the little bit that they had that they was willing to give now, I, I want you to understand this. And you go back over into John, and there's just a small boy there. There's just a lad, and they pretty much stole his lunch. Read your Bible. Flip over to the book of John. I want you to read that. They took that young boy's lunch. And they said, here you go. That's all we got. That's all we got. Deal with it. But Jesus blessed what that one young boy had. He just had enough for himself. You guys catching this church? Are you seeing what's happening here? They took the willingness of one small boy and they fed a multitude. They fed 5,000 men plus women and children. But you know what? There was, a, there was people that was, number one, there was people that was willing to seek him out. They followed after Jesus no matter where he was going, they was following. Jesus had compassion on them. He began to teach them. He began to heal them. And then the people kept listening to what he commanded them to do. And Jesus fed them. But it said he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Now I want you to see right here, this is very important. One of the things that I'm afraid that you might miss if you read it through in a hurry. Who give the food out? The disciples. How many were they? There's 12. But these disciples who, uh, you know, and it, you, you really have to almost add your own context here. But if you kind of read throughout uh, the different things in which they've done, you kind of see that whenever they thought they was doing right, usually they was doing something wrong. Whenever they was trying to uh, keep the little children from coming to Jesus. And he says, suffer the little children come unto me. Don't tell them not to. And they begin to, they begin to tell Jesus, you need to have these people go away. We ain't got nothing to feed them. It's going to be supper time. Like it was their job to tell Jesus what time it was. But there was 12 disciples. But it says, He blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples. And the disciples to the multitude. The disciples took that blessed meal. That one person was willing to sacrifice, being a, a, a young lad. But Jesus blessed it. And then he gave it to his disciples to distribute. 
You catching that? Meaning like in a church-like sense, like an idea or a vision. Yeah, yeah, we're back there. Who would have thought? Who would have thought we'd have went back to our church? But you look at somebody's vision, maybe some one, per one small person's vision. But Jesus can bless it and the whole church can do it. Did you catch that? Did you catch it? Just by Jesus feeding 5,000 preachers, you come all the way back to fussing on us. No. That's God's word. I'm just a messenger. But he gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. In verse 20 it says they all did eat. They all eat. Now it says they all eat. That was those 5,000 men, the women and the children. And I'm going to tell you, you look at it like this, church. Thanksgiving just a few days ago. Some of you may still have been eating dinners yesterday. I don't know. They was uh, about 33, between 33 and 35 of us at Bubba and Bonita's on Thursday. That's a bunch of people, ain't it? It took a bunch of food to feed us. I mean, we a bunch of holes, we ain't, we, ain't, we ain't afraid of gluttony. That's just that's just truth matter of it. We ain't, we ain't afraid of gluttony, we'll flat throw it down. Matthew eat easy though, I think he only had two plates. Me and Mindy, we had been to two dinners already. I didn't stop me from having a big, huge plate and a big plate of dessert, too. But it takes a lot of food to feed these people. Now, you think of just your dinners that you've had. There's a lot of food cooked, wasn't there? You think of how many pounds of food that was cooked just, just in the last three, four days. That's a lot of food. But if you take... We'd have probably all laughed Bonita out of the county if she'd have tried to feed us with five loaves and two fish. I probably wouldn't have flew over too well, would it, Bubba? I'd have went back to where we eat before and I'd eat again. But I want you to think of these people, the, the thoughts that they may have had. That's never going to work. I want you to think of the doubters that was there. You think of those people that were sitting around that was truly was hungry. And as we began looking, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? But then Jesus blessed. And then I want you to imagine these people feasting. I don't think, I, I, I really don't think people just nibbled. I think people eat. I think they had a Thanksgiving meal sitting right there in their companies of fifties and hundreds. I think they sat there on that grass and I think they feasted is what I think happened. Because it says they were all filled. They were all full. And they took up of the fragments. Now get to this. They was fragments. They was leftovers. But how many baskets? They was 12 baskets left over. How many disciples we decide they was? They was 12. Do you not see the irony right there? Do you not see what Jesus just done? Do you not see that the way God's word is beginning to work right here? Do you not see what is happening? They took the 12 doubters that was there. And they got to take food with them. Now what was that that they got to take? Number one, this was a blessing that they could have took either just for them. Something that they could have remembered. Yeah, I remember that time there was all them people sitting out there on the grass. And Jesus said, you know what? You know, just bring me that food. I'm going to bless it. They could have looked in that basket whenever they wanted to. And they could have seen. They could have been reminded. They could have felt what happened that day. You catching that church? You may have already been to your desert place. And there may have already been a healing there. There may have already been a teaching. But did you get a basket full to go with you? Is that fair enough to say? Hey, it was Thanksgiving this week. How long did it take you to give thanks? We all should have been late for church this morning because we couldn't get done in time. Amen? 
Did you give thanks for that basket you got to take with you? Or did you just think and look at it? Oh, that was a waste. All that food, now we got 12 baskets left over. Or did you take your basket with you, church? Did you take your basket with you and find somebody that was hungry on the way home? And did you look and did you see, you know, this right here, well, this was a blessing from an almighty. Let me share this with you. Did you catch that? Did you catch that, church? Did you catch the fact that you sharing your blessings can fill someone else? I wonder why there was 12 baskets left over. But then I really begin to think about it. And I begin to, to, to really ponder upon this question of why was there 12 left over? There was a basket for each disciple that they could take with them. And they could either reflect upon it in a time of need. And they say, well, you know, there's that full basket. From that day when Jesus delivered, there's that basket. Well, they could help someone out along the way. Now, you think about this, church. You think about this. Now, let me tell you the spot where we're at as far as, as Christians in a, in a modern church society. Christ gives us a blessing. You know what the last thing we want to do with it is? Is share it. And I don't mean share it by letting you actually have part of it. I mean share it with this right here. We want to share it. And that baffles me. I often wonder why people don't want to share with others the good things that God's done for them. You have any problem with sharing with other people what Christ has done for you? Well, no, preacher, I don't have a bit of problem with that. It just depends on who I'm around. Exactly. Preacher, I'm not ashamed of him. It just never was brought up in conversation, and I didn't, you know, want to be that odd person that was, you know, standing there. Uh, how many of you went Black Friday shopping? I did. There's gobs of people at the Walmart. I wonder how many lost people was around you Friday, Thursday night and Friday. I wonder how many lost people was around you. Did you share your basket with them? Preacher, I guarded my buggy with everything. There wasn't nobody touching my basket. That ain't the basket I'm talking about, church. Did you share that basket of food with them? Of that blessing, that spiritual nourishment that God saw fit to send you away with did you share it? Now you think about this, church. You think just the people of Oakdale that went Black Friday shopping. There's a good handful of us. Maybe 12. How many people could we have fed with our little basket? How many lost people do you think could have got saved if we just went around sharing? Probably the only time we said Lord or Jesus or anything like that was probably saying, good Lord, would you look at that deal? You know what I'm saying? And they all did eat and were filled and they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets. Let us stand together.